thanks for joining us for this service from Youth Hope with Trinity Gask and Kim Kill for our church service for the 7th of February. Our music today is uh, Love Divine, brought to us from the New Scottish Hymns Band, Gracious Spirit, sung by our own congregation, and Seek Ye First, also sung by our own congregation. Today's reading is from Psalm 1, and we're going to be thinking about the power of words. Words can kill, but words can also give life. Hope you enjoy the service. Excelling joy of heaven to earth come down, fixing us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure.
Let's join together now in prayer. Our Father God, love divine, sovereign creator, ruler of angels, yet friend of sinners, we bow before you in worship. We thank you for your word. You are not like the idols of ancient peoples, statues with mouths that can't speak. No one has seen your mouth, but plenty have heard your voice. It thunders in the powers of nature. It speaks silently in the starry sky. It whispers in our hearts. Your word became visible in Jesus, the word made flesh. And so we thank you that today as we offer our words to you in praise and prayer and worship, we can listen for your words to us. We confess that we are not very good at listening. We are so taken up with our own affairs, our own interests, we aren't even very good at listening to our neighbours around us. We listen too often to the wrong voices, the ones that get us into trouble, that are deceptive and destructive. Your promise is that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us. We hear those words. Help us now believe them. Act on them by confessing our sins and live because they are true. Now open our ears and our hearts to more of your divine love as we continue in worship and continue in prayer with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Happy is the man who does not take the wicked for his guide, nor walk the road that sinners tread, nor take his seat among the scornful. The law of the Lord is his delight, the law his meditation night and day. He is like a tree planted beside a watercourse which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf never withers. In all that he does he prospers. Wicked men are not like this. They are like chaff driven by the wind. So when judgment comes, the wicked shall not stand firm, nor shall sinners stand in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed.
You know the saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's obviously not true. Words do hurt people. Words can be very powerful. I read of a man who had uh, esophageal cancer. Cancer of the esophagus, okay? <clears throat> that, uh, in those days, we're talking about the 1970s, was an incurable condition. Now, he'd had an operation, but of course it was bound to return and, and get him in the end. And that's what everybody believed, and he believed, and a few weeks after the operation, he died. In the autopsy, they discovered that he had one or two spots of cancer in his body, but he did not die of cancer. He died because he believed he was going to die. The words, the um, diagnosis, the things the surgeon said to him, convinced him he was going to die. A young man says to a young woman, I love you. And she blossoms like a crocus in the sun in the spring. And for life begins. Children, if they grow up, always being told that they're stupid, they're bad, their parents are disappointed in them, it's not surprising that they'll turn out like they've been defined by the words used about them. It's tricky bringing children up because sometimes they are bad and do stupid things. You have to be positive while being truthful. It's not easy. We have to be careful about the words we use. Because sometimes words can be used wrongly. A false, wrong diagnosis can be a sentence of death for someone who really believes those words and gives up hope. A false lover who, once they've got what they want, dumps the person they once said, I love you to. Negative self-esteem can ruin a whole person's life. Words can kill. And words, of course, can give life too. The words we're talking about today are the words that come from the mouth of God. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. So we know that his words are not false. His words give life. His words can be trusted. In this period of, of Lent, we're thinking about how Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted of the devil, combating Satan. And his weapon, Jesus' weapon in that battle, was scripture, the words of God. The very first temptation, Jesus was uh, showing all the, the stones in the desert and Satan said to him, if you're really the son of God, you can turn these stones into bread and satisfy your hunger. And Jesus' answer was, man does not live in bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He was directly comparing bread for the body with another kind of bread, bread for the soul, the spirit. And he wasn't pitching one against the other. He says, we need both. We are physical and we are spiritual. Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And we know that we need our daily bread. Three square meals a day, five portions of fruit or vegetable, a lot more fibre than we probably get in our Western diet, and we should drink plenty, maybe more than we do too. But do we give as much thought to our spiritual diet as we do to our cooking? So what about these words that give life? Where do we get them from? Well, the Bible. Jesus said, it's the words that come from the mouth of God. And these words are very important because that's the kind of information we can't get from anywhere else. It's absolutely vital, therefore. Today, people think uh, science and reason give us all the information that we need. And there is no question that science has been incredibly successful in the last 500 years, unravelling all kinds of secrets of the universe, how the planets move and galaxies far away, and enabling us to, to land a small car, basically, pinpoint accuracy on the surface of Mars. Amazing what science can do. But there are other things that science cannot ever help us with. We need 
an authoritative word that illuminates a situation which otherwise would be con would be completely dark. A revelation is the, the word that we're looking for. Information that simply isn't accessible by reason or science or a clever experiment. I remember reading a book by a man called Stephen Covey about how he got onto the underground one day in, uh, in a, an American city and as he sat there just minding his own business another man came on with a couple of children uh, the man sat down near Stephen Covey and the children just began to run up and down the carriage making all kinds of noise and poking people and being a real nuisance and Stephen Covey decided he had to do something about it so he, he spoke to the man pointing out the, the behaviour of his children in as nice a way as he possibly could the man who had just been in a daydream basically completely ignoring the behaviour of his own children turned round to Stephen Covey and said I'm, I'm sorry we've just come from the hospital where their mother died I suppose the children don't know how to deal with it for Stephen Covey, that was what he called a paradigm shift. A little bit of verbal revelation, a bit of information he didn't know, he probably couldn't have known, would never have worked out. But his whole view of the situation in that underground carriage completely changed in that instant. A revelation. And that's why science can only tell us so much about the universe, and it can tell us the most important things. There's a, a kettle boiling. Why is the kettle boiling? Well, you ask the scientist, and a science can, scientist can tell you all about the, the heat uh, underneath the, the kettle, getting into the water, and the water getting up to a particular temperature, and at a particular temperature, the water molecules fly off and create the, the pressure which makes the kettle whistle. You could also ask Mrs Doyle why the kettle is boiling. She doesn't know anything about science, but she'll say, I'm making a cup of tea. Now, both explanations are right. I wonder which one is the more important. The scientist can tell you all about why that kettle is boiling, but if you go into the kitchen and look at that kettle boiling and ask why is it boiling, you're not really interested in molecules. You want to know who put it on and why. And all the scientific explanations of the whole universe still leaves us asking the question, why? Life, real life, is only possible after we know the answer to that question. There's a man in Psalm 1, I presume it's a man, it could just as easily be a woman, who delights in God's word, who meditates on it. And the psalmist describes what that person is like. They're like a flourishing tree planted by a stream, planted by water. The water represents the life-giving word. And so the tree grows. No matter what the weather is like, it doesn't wither. Even in a drought, there's a secret source of water feeding the roots in that tree. So when other trees wilt, other trees die, this one continues to produce green leaves and fruit. The last year has been a tough year for a kind of drought, if you like. How have we fared in that year? A recent survey showed that there's been an increase in Bible reading among Christians and interestingly, especially among younger ones. And one of the benefits being reported was an increase in mental health. Many people, in other words, have been reading the Bible and finding in the scriptures a spring of living water that helped to keep them going through the, the darkness and the drought of this last year of lockdown and pandemic. The author who reported the results of this survey suggests three reasons why the Bible is a very appropriate book to read at this time of pandemic. The first one is it offers comfort and hope and strength, especially for people under pressure or stressed or worried or fearful like we have been. Words and verses like, like the, uh, the saying of Jesus, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's the first reason. 
But the second reason is that the Bible isn't all nice stories about nice people. If all you remember from your Sunday school days was Noah's Ark and, and, and uh, some of the parables of Jesus, the sword and the seed, you need to know that the Bible is a lot, lot more than that. The whole of life is there in the Bible and all the ugly and violent bits too. In other words, Bible times were real, Bible people were real, and the faith of the Bible people was real, because they found that in their tough times, God was there with them and for them. And the third thing that this author said about uh, the value of the Bible is that the, vi the Bible is, is full of stories, but it's also mainly one big story, from creation to consummation, from Genesis to Revelation, beginning to end. And the author suggests when we read the whole book and we see the big picture, it's reassuring to know that we're part of it. There is a purpose in everything. The universe that the scientists describe isn't just a random accident, and our lives aren't just flotsam on the tide of time. The cross and the resurrection are at the heart of that story, and it's what makes sense of it all. Death leading to life. A tragedy, the greatest tragedy in history, leading to the greatest victory in history. The cruelty and violence of the cross, leading to an outpouring of love as Jesus pours his spirit into the hearts of his people. And so Psalm 1 pictures a, a tree with deep, secure roots fed by the stream. There's another picture in Psalm 1 too, of chaff. Chaff are the husks of grain as they're being threshed and thrown into the air. The heavy grain falls straight back down, but the husks are blown away by the breeze. And the psalmist talked about the wicked in this way. Those who mock, according to verse 1. They may mock the religious people in good times, but what the psalmist is saying is in the hard times, that little breeze will knock them down. But that man or woman who meditates on the law of the Lord will have deep roots. They all go through the same storm as anybody else, disease, death, disappointment, you name it. They're not immune. But because of their roots, they'll stand firm and survive because they listen to and meditate on the words of God. That's the power of the word of God contained in the Bible. And we need to read it more. Let me remind you at this stage of the daily reading plan and the church website, the idea was that you could read the New Testament in the 40 days of Lent. It's all um, divided up so you can just take each day off and you'll know you'll be getting through the Bible in 40 days. And if you had maybe thought of doing that, haven't started, doesn't matter. Doesn't really matter when you start. Start now. I've also been telling you about the, the things I'm giving up over Lent, something different for each week. This week, I'm going to give up TV. Now, it's not as if I don't have enough books to read. And I ought to admit that I do have a TV recorder, so I'm not going to miss everything. But still, it's a challenge. Now, you're welcome to try that too if you want. Unless, of course, there's a medical reason and you've got a doctor's line. Maybe you could spend the time reading the Bible. Amen. Let's turn our hearts again in prayer as we bring God our prayers for others. Heavenly Father, you know all our needs before we bring them to you. Jesus taught us to pray, give us our daily bread. We thank you that you provide for all our basic needs. We also know that there are many who are not so blessed and who struggle each day to get enough to eat. We pray for them. Thank you for the outpouring of compassion and care in these days through food banks and community outreaches. We thank you that churches are at the forefront of many of these initiatives, witnessing to the power of your love to motivate and inspire. Bless that witness, that those at the receiving end of the material help might find their way to you 
and find the spiritual help that is our greatest need. We think of how Jesus said to the devil, We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. And so bless your church in this land and throughout the world, that your word may be clearly heard and visibly seen in the lives of your people. We give you thanks for the success of the vaccination programme and pray for protection for those still to receive it. We pray that throughout the world the inequality of distribution would stir the consciences of governments so that everyone can get the protection they need. We pray for the the COP26 conference in Glasgow later this year as it again raises the issue of climate change and what we are doing to our planet. We thank you for the churches that are involved in seeking to be carbon neutral and leading the way. We pray for a new sense of our responsibility before you, for the planet you have given us which provides our daily bread, and which we also share with all the other creatures you created and care for. Forgive our self-centred exploitation of natural resources, our arrogant assumption that we have rights above all other living things, and bring us back in humility to you. We pray now especially for Vanuatu, those islands in the Pacific, following the World Day of Prayer on Friday. Thank you for the strong Christian faith of the people in these islands. They are very vulnerable from many dangers. Help them to be resilient in the face of hurricanes and volcanoes. Make the rest of the world aware of how rising sea levels will affect them seriously because of our lifestyles and how plastic pollution affects their seas, their rural environment and their livelihoods. Grant that nation a greater success in educating their young folk and above all keep their faith strong as they stand in God. Closer to home we remember our families and loved ones and give you thanks for them and ask that they might know your blessing, your help in whatever their needs might be. Be close to those in our community who have lost loved ones Give strength to those who are weak because of ill health and to those who care for them at home or in hospital. We pray for our homes as they look after our elderly. Give the staff compassion and protect them from all harm. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now may you know the blessing of God the Father, the love of God the Son, and the peace of God the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.